Okay, my name is Jim Grogan. I'm a wildlife bird artist specializing in birds in North America. I've been living in Detroit for about 35 years. I went to the College of Creative Studies and I have a BFA in Fine Arts. I specialize in drawing birds in North America. I was inspired. I went to a show at the DIA. It was a, a the John James Audubon show at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I when I saw that it really inspired me, and that's what I wanted to wanted to do is to is to draw a bird because I have passion for birds. As a young child, I was had the opportunity of being surrounded by nature and I saw it firsthand and I thought it was beautiful. I graduated with a BFA from the College of Creative Studies in Fine Arts. My journey started way back when I was first going to school as a fine artist and I was sidetracked by teachers and students alike that were telling me that you couldn't make any money in fine arts, you had to go into commercial art. And at the time, computers computers were start coming in. We had Illustrator, we had Cork Express, we had Photoshop, and I I failed my computer classes. I did not want a computer to dictate and tell me how to draw. So I spent a small stint in advertising. It was just a computer that really, it, it was just not my cup of tea. So I uh, basically went back to my love of drawing birds and my passion. As a child, like any child, uh, who was an artist, I drew, I've been drawing since I was three. I was drawing on my parents' walls before I was drawing on paper. And like any kid, I was drawing things like cars and trucks and buildings. And I was, then I would make robots and flying saucers. Uh, I really started doing birds. I probably elementary school at fifth grade in 1977. I did a, a book report on the Atlantic Puffin. Um, at the time, the, the teacher was Mr. Henderson, and he thought my drawings were so excellent that he wanted to keep my drawings for the uh, other classes in the near future uh, to show his samples for the class, which I was really proud of. So I did, I did some drawings. Uh, so the birds kind of came probably more like in high school. I started drawing more birds. So I, I had to put together a portfolio for the College Creative Studies to get in. And I was also leaning on going, before I went into graphic arts, I, I was thinking about going into illustration, but learning, by having the opportunity of going into graphic arts, I did find out and learn a lot about advertising and corporate identity, logo design and layout. But again, I just, I, I, I honestly would have to say I took the harder road road because the thing, the problem with the computer, if even if I were good at it, a lot of artists when they were in high school, right before they, they got into college, they, we were all artists. We were like the best artists in the whole school. There were only about three artists in the whole high school that could draw like I could draw. But when I got into college, we had I had these choices put in front of me. And I know for a fact that if I were to go into computer graphics, I would slowly lose my drawing skills to the point where I couldn't draw anymore. And that frightened me. I didn't want to lose that technique. I didn't want to lose that talent. It's like anything else. If you have a skill and you have the talent, you have to be an artist every day to practice your craft. Just like an Olympic swimmer has to practice four to eight hours every day to specialize in and to be good at what they do, because if you don't use it, you lose it. That's, that's just that's just how I feel. I, I want to show you a drawing that I did. Uh, this is 
my Robin. This is from Milford High School. Okay. Okay. Um, I won first place award. This was in 19, 1985 at Milford High, Michigan. I like to start showing my drawings. Is that is that okay with you? Or sure, sure. Let's do that. Oh, okay. Just uh, I use uh color pencils. I like to show you the color pencils that I used before I show you the drawing. So this is uh Prisma Color Pencils Premier. These are what I use here. So my pencils. Um, I've been working with color pencils for 42 years now. I started, my father bought my first box of color pencils in 1980. I was uh, 15 years old. And I love color pencils because I have, I have full control. I don't like watercolor. I don't like wash. I like pencil. I get high quality detail with the point of the pencil. Uh, I love coloring. I love layering. So here is a picture of the uh, barn owl that I drew, all in color pencils. And uh, it's done on a paper called Canson paper. It's acid free. It's a dark brown color. So when I put the whites on here, everything really pops out. Everything comes out. Uh, it just has a different effect than using a white background. I do have samples of my birds that were done with a white background. Uh, other papers that I use is the Fast Morse acid-free uh, medium surface paper. Um, so this, the barn owl, the story behind the barn owl, that it's a, a farmer's best friend because it, it it's like a pest control. It kills small animals and mammals and rats and so forth for the um inside the barns of uh farmers that's my first one so um i'd like to show you my sample of the comparison between the male and the female bird and the bird species this is my drawing of the northern cardinals within the bird species the cardinal the male cardinal has more colored than the female. The male cardinal is a bright red, and the female is a light yellow or brownish color, more low profile. And it, this is what they call the plumage of the bird, which meaning the color and the feathers is the plumage. And the male is more colorful than the female. Okay, this is my... This is my black hat chickadee. Um, when I did this, uh, when I finished the background, I realized that it, it, it was like a halo around the whole bird. You know, and it almost you zoom, like you can zoom into the whole thing. And it really makes it pop out. So you, you can see here, I really am thinking about the detail. When I draw, I don't draw like other artists. I draw from the inside out, not from the outside. And I usually start with the eye, and work together with some feathers, and then the beak, and then the head, and then the body. I usually work from three photographs, one for the bird, one for the background, and one for additional reference. Um, I was taking photos off the internet uh, to use as reference, but I connected with a Canadian photographer in uh, Windsor, Canada, that's also a nature photographer, and he's given me permission to use his photos to draw from. That's that there. And this is my last bird drawing. This is the, this here is the common loon. It's a North Atlantic uh, bird. What you see here is not, the, the young bird here is not called a duckling. It's called a, it's called a straight. Um, as you can see, the entire drawing is all done with cool colors. We have dark blues, we have greens, we have light blues. But the jewel of the painting 
is the eye of the loon. As you can see here, the red uh, it's like a red ruby. And it's the only warm color in the whole drawing. I don't care how on the pupil the reflection on the eye. And it really, really looks nice. And then of course, I have a lot of detail going on here with uh it almost looks like uh cubism style, more graphic than it does look like a photograph. So that's my drawings. How did you decide that birds are going to be your subject matter? Well, I love birds. Well, I grew up with nature and I was surrounded by nature. We had a bird feeder in our backyard. You know, we had blue jays and cardinals and so forth. Um, we took many nature trips when I was a child. It's unfortunate some people have never even experienced looking at a tree or an acorn or a, a hill or a waterfall. My mother was a gardener and she loved plant life and we had trilliums growing in our backyard. Like I said before, what really inspired me is when I went to the DI, when I went to the Detroit Institute of Arts to see the uh, display of John James Audubon's work. A lot of people think that he worked with oils and he did not. He worked with uh, graphite, watercolor, and ink. And um, he did not do his backgrounds. He had a, an apprentice he was hiring to do his backgrounds. I would just, when I look at birds, I when I was younger, I just the way they move, their heads, how they move, just looking at them is just so fascinating how they fly. It's just you go, you you never see the same thing again. When you go out, bird, when I go out bird watching, there's always something new. There's always some new discovery, a new, a new visual, a new look. So, and like I said before in my bio, I want to, I love birds and I want to share the passion. I want to give this to people. I want to give this, I want to give them this joy and happiness that my artwork portrays, that, that, makes it happen for me and and other people. Can you identify some artists that influenced your art? Uh, there's several, of course there's John James Audubon, Roy Troy Peterson, David Allen Sibley, Arthur Singer. I would say that Things have changed. If I was doing this 40, 45 years ago, there's this uh, big art competition they have it every year in uh, Upper State, Minnesota. And it, it's called the, the uh, U.S. Duck Stamp Competition. It's like the Super Bowl of art, art contests. It's for the U.S. Duck Stamp Competition. And the the money made from that is go towards proceeds uh, of saving wildlife, territory, and land. How would you describe your evolution from your teens when you mm -hmm. started to now? I started, I probably started most of my bird drawings when I got, once I got into high school. So, but I really didn't get into it. I drew a couple of drawings. I did the first one I did was my wood duck. And I did that right after I graduated from college. It was done in 19. 93 and then I did a Gadwell duck and then I went did a Cooper's hawk and back then the drawings were crude they um not a lot of detail kind of flat looking mostly white backgrounds no foliage no leaves in the background that came later I had uh, my first show was in 2008 at a rest at a piece of Ria called Motor City Brewery, and I sold every piece. I sold out, and I got two commissions after the show. I mean, I had a lot of classes uh, when I was in fine arts at College Career Studies. I was I took a, a, a class in anatomy of the human body, which I was responsible for drawing the the uh, bone structure and the muscle structures of the human body. Um, it's 
very difficult. I'm confused about how people think. They think if you could draw a bird, you could draw a person's face or you could draw a hand. And I'm thinking that's just a whole nother animal. That's a whole nother like way of thinking. All I know is that my underlying drawing has to be ana anatomically correct. And it doesn't matter how much color I put on the drawing. If that lineage is not correct, it's not going to look proportionally uh, throughout the drawing. Okay. Uh, so when I was at College Career Studies, the uh, biggest question as an illustrator was, you have to develop a style. You have to very have to develop your develop your very own style to be unique from other artists because you don't want to be doing the same thing other artists are doing, not unless it's for practice or to copy other people's work for inspiration and in practice. So what happened, I had a figure drawing class in 1988 with Mrs. Underdown and the assignment was to draw a fashion model, male or female, full body, of course, they were using fashion magazines for reference and so forth, uh, like Glamour for the woman and maybe GQ for the men. So everyone who did that assignment, they basically did everything super photorealism. Everything was really tight. I'm not saying the artwork wasn't any good. It was just all photorealism and it, and everyone did photorealism work the whole class so i was the only one that went outside of the box i went and i incorporated my own style it's a a fast sketch it's a i take the pencil here's the pencils i use here and i just do a really fast line line work and just I, I put the spontaneous line down and I leave it there. I don't put make it more color. I don't want to get it muddy. I want it crisp and I want it fresh. So here's an example. It's kind of big, but this is my drawing that I did. Can you see the whole right there? This is my uh, drawing. As you can see, uh, it all long work. It's all kind of like very fast and energetic that I'm trying to do with my words. And of course, I got to do plus on this. Every artist has to be respected for what they do. There's no like, oh, he's better than me or that person's better than me because their drawings look like this and their drawings look like that. Every artist is going to be unique. Every artist is going to have their own take on this, and they're going to have their own style. So I, I don't down people who work with water, watercolors or acrylics or pen and ink because if that's the medium they want to use and that's the direction they want to go go with, and that's that's perfectly fine. It's just I just. Uh, I've been told like you should learn you should go back into painting you should do this I now I've done I'm using pastel now I wasn't using pastel uh pastel was very uh like chart like uh, this the charcoal chalk I was using in the past it's just uh it's like a chalk chalk square it was very powdery very messy yeah. I store and I found these new they are called pan pastels and they're like a, a cosmetic casing it's a like a round plastic casing pan pastel and what I use is I use this uh brush varnish seeing it has uh, in the rubber on there look like this look looks like this here so I use this. I also use uh, paper towels and Q-tip -tip swabs to. So what I'm actually see before I was actually drawing 
the bird first, which take about maybe 60 hours. And then I had to draw the background because I had the sample here. This On the common loom, it was all done with color pencils. The background took took almost longer than the bird itself because it's all done in color pencils. Because you have to remember now, I'm using one point and one pencil to fill in uh, an eight by ten or eleven by fourteen background. It's very time consuming. Most people think when they draw with colored pencil, the way they make a harder line is just put, putting more pressure on it. Well, I don't do that. I I, I start out with a layer. Uh, for an example, is when I draw when I use black, I really only use black for the pupil of the eye of the bird. If like if the common loon has a blackish color, so this entire background was done with colored pencils, but it takes it's very time consuming. I work with layers. I don't, an artist would think if I want to take a pen, pencil and put the paper and make it really dark, all I have to do is put more weight on the pencil point to get the darkness, but I don't do that. I work with layers. I do a very light layer of say indigo blue and I keep building and building on top of it until I get the desired effect. Um, I don't like to use straight black on anything. So what I do is to make my blacks more richer, I add indigo blue or a red burgundy or a dark green, and that gives me different hues of black, of black colors. So now in the past, I would draw the bird first and I would get a gist of, of what the bird is gonna look like. And then I would draw the background with the colored pencils. But now that I'm experimenting with pastels, I can I can actually lay more ground with the pastel than I can with the color pencil. So I have to actually do it the opposite because if I draw the bird first and then I draw the background with pastels and I make a mistake with the pastels, I have to redraw the bird all over again. So now I have to do it the other way around. I have to put the pastel back down first and once that looks uh, correct, pleasingly correct, then I can draw the bird. So that's what I'm doing now. So I went from just drawing a bird with a simple branch to drawing the bird with pastel backgrounds, but I'm only using the, the backgrounds as a backdrop. I don't want it to take away from the main subject of the bird. So I'm doing a very simple, a very simple background with the pastels and then I'm coming in with the bird drawing. And I can also incorporate colored pencil over the pastel, say if I have some type of uh, leaves or flowers or foliage that I want in the background, I can lay the pastel first with the basic colors that I need, which is no more than two or three. And then I can come over the pastel with colored pencils to add the fine detail that I like. As an artist, I realized that color does sell. People love color. If I could maybe branch out to maybe drawing birds of paradise, I think the first bird I'd like to draw would be the peacock with the feathers coming out. And I, uh, I have I have so many bird drawings I have to draw still. So, um, I thought about maybe a, making a calendar up. Uh, my birds for the season, you know, I do uh, my Baltimore Orioles because they're orange. Maybe do it for October and do the Cardinals for this December, so forth. So, well, I've been entering this uh, local gallery in Detroit behind the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's called the Scarab Club, and they've been around since the, the 19, 1910. So this is the uh, 2022 Scarab Club's Arts Annual. 
and I've been in this arts annual for about, about five times. And they published my, this is my Robin's, my Robin's Eggs Nest that they published. The eggs. Now I have a story about the Robin's Egg. So I was about maybe eight or nine years old. I was in the woods in the backyard and I found a Robin's Eggs Nest with the blue eggs. And I was so excited I ran home. I said, Mom, Mom, come over here. I want you to come out in the woods and see this. And it was very, very, very loving and very uh, caring moment at the time. They say if you touch the eggs, they won't go back to it because they can smell the, the human fingers. So those uh, eggs pop out like, like blue emeralds in a way. So... And I also wanted, I, that's the first drawing I did with a bird's nest. I wanted to incorporate an actual nest with my bird drawings. Uh, just like the, each bird has a different egg color. A lot of my art journey, I've been collecting birds and books on birds and uh, migration and habitat and so forth. And I pick up this really cool book, uh, the book of eggs, bird eggs, every species in the world. And this gives me, uh, you know, when you study about birds, it's called ornithology and wealth of information. You can never, ever stop learning about the birds, the plumage, their migration, their habitat. Uh, the list goes on and on. You could just, just really, really, I try to take about a half hour out of my day every day to look at my bird books visually. So I now I can know what a a purple finch looks like or a a pintail duck or a, or a blue heron, a brown pelican. I just want to be intrigued visually. I I, I learn the way I think it's visual. Everything's visual. I have to see it to absorb it and then to remember it. So it also helps me during my art shows where I can actually explain to people not only my process and my technique, but uh, where the bird lives, what it does, what it eats, where it lives. So it, it's uh, it, it's very helpful. And I've also uh, been engaging in with the uh, my local Audubon Society, the Detroit Audubon. We go on bird field trips and we have binoculars. We're looking for these birds. So. It's it's quite quite intriguing. These birds they depend on an ecosystem, which you told me before this interview that it's shrinking. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, that is shrinking quite rapidly. It's not just the bird itself, but what it feeds on, which are insects. Uh, there are hard, been a, a lot of insects that have gone on the in, uh, uh, instinct list. So I, a while back ago, I had an idea of how when John James did his Birds of America, I was thinking of coming out with my own version, becoming up with the book that says the extinct birds of America and to record the birds that are just about to go on the extinction list. It's just rapid destruction of the planet just for greed. Uh, I have a story to tell you. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the uh, the Boundary Waters in Upper State Minnesota. This is a perfect example of greed and corporate greed. Um, this is a very unique can, uh, canoe, kayaking, beautiful woods, beautiful forests, and a company wants to come in and build a copper mining or right smack in the middle of the habitat. And they've been trying to fight this for almost a decade now. Um, it was in 2018, I, one of the famous birds of, in Minnesota is the common loon. And I, I donated, uh, this is my common loon. I donated my uh, common. I, uh, I sent them twenty of my five by seven bird note cards to the common loon for a fundraiser. 
Well, I also make five by seven bird note cards. So this is my Waltz of the Hummingbirds. And this is the card I have made. And it has a, there it is. And then it has the blank. And then on the back, I have the visual of the bird, the name of the bird, where it lives and what kind of food it eats, and then a small bio about myself on the bottom. I'm working on my spring cardinals now. Well, actually, actually they're finished. Um, I want to start incorporating flowers within my backgrounds, not where it takes away, like I said before, not when it takes away for the main subject. Um, And I also, I was thinking about drawing, maybe looking into drawing maybe some insects, like, like some butterflies or, uh, I've been kind of stubborn, you know, you, you get set in your ways, you don't want to experiment, you want to just keep doing what you've been doing. But I, I, I've had several people ask me, can you draw something else besides birds? I know it sounds like a cliche, but, um, Maybe if I did start drawing other things that were related to my birds, that might help per push my bird idea. Um, I could draw other things that are related to birds. First, say I could draw bird eggs. I could draw bird feathers. I could draw scientific illustrations of their claws and their nails. And uh, I could do headshots. Um, so it, it is a it's a long journey and it takes dedication it takes time and uh i i strive for perfectionism i just i just you know i look at drawings that i've done 12 15 years ago and i i can see there's definitely an improvement um a friend of mine has said something to me i'll never forget what he said he says you cannot finish until you start Whatever drawing that I do now is going to reflect the next one after that, and then so on and so on and so on. So I think something that I really like, the morning dove is coming out really nicely. Um, it's the bird of peace. Um, there's a gallery downtown called Swords into Plowshares. It's a peace gallery, and that's the, because the dove represents peace. I think it would be a nice addition to their peace gallery. I did come across a poet. We're thinking about making a book together where I could draw the birds in the book and there'll be poetry below the each image of the bird. I haven't really reached out. Uh, I thought maybe reaching out to a greeting card company like Hallmark or American Greetings. I just feel my age range for my art is probably between the ages of 25 to 95. Um, most of my work is kind of geared towards females. Um, the men are only interested in birds that kill or, or birds they kill, like waterfowl, like ducks. They also like birds of prey, um, hawks and peregrine falcons, eagles, uh, owls, um, raptors. The women are into songbirds. They're into chickadees, wobblers, hummingbirds, blue jays. Um, I, like I said before, I've, I've been published in the Scarab Club's art annual. So that might be a new avenue to look for me to look into more is maybe find a way how I, I can get published and actually have a real book. Or as I was talking before, maybe I could make a, cal a calendar too. So There's also magazines who specialize in birds. Have you tried to reach out to them? I reached out to the Detroit Autobahn already. Um, I'm trying to conjure up an idea where I could sell my bird cars at one of their bird functions and put give all the proceeds to Detroit Audubon. And that way I can help them out and then I could, that they would help advertise myself with other birders who have the same interest.
I did have a solo show at the Detroit Institute of Arts. It was an art demo, an art demonstration. I made like eight hundred and forty dollars in six hours. A lot of the times, the uh, the National Audubon Society they don't really have art shows. They have photography contests in their magazine. Did you feel that people still need time to understand color pencils? They're telling me that drawings are not as prominent as, say, oils or acrylics. They, it's a, drawing is kind of like below that. It's kind of like these are drawings. These are not paintings. They don't really are going to get the kind of money that you will get for an oil painting. Um, one of the biggest questions that I was given by a former artist of mine was saying that, do you even know that the medium and the paper you're using is archival? Is it acid free? Uh, and even so before that, I was kind of oblivious about it all. Then I had to look into it. I got drawings that go back 20, 25 years and they're framed and there's no fading of the colors or there's no uh, oddness going on with the pigment or, or anything. Um, I've just been told that drawings don't fetch as much money as the paintings, paintings do. My take on this one is it doesn't matter what medium you use. It's what you do with it that makes the magic happen. Like I said before, Audubon didn't work in oils. It doesn't. I think that mixed media has been it's more accepted these days than it was in the past. So, I'm sure you know a lot of artists that use oil pastels. They use pastel. They use pen and ink. They use gouache. They use mixed mixed media. Now we have computer graphics to add to it. Now we can make something that's half old school drawing and the other half is high tech, um, high res resolution gra uh, computer graphics. Um, I have a niece that went to school for computer graphics and now I'm coming up with an idea. Maybe I can collaborate with her where I could do uh, half illustration, half computer art and put it, mesh it together and make it in its own own look. It is September, the end of September. What are your plans for the end of the year? Uh, I just got accepted to Detroit Art Detroit Artist Market's holiday show. I entered 14, 11 by 14 frame prints and four got accepted. I do this every year. Um, I've been exhibiting at the Detroit Artist Market since 2006. I'm also entering the gold medal show at the Scarab Club. And like I showed you before, I hope I get it. one of my birds printed in the Scarab Club's arts annual for the gold medal show. This is, this is going to be, from now until the end of December, this is going to be my time to really research where I can put my art, appropriate place to put my art. Currently, have you ever heard of the uh, franchise? It's called Wild Birds Unlimited. It's a it's a it's a store that specializes in bird houses and bird food and so forth. Well, it's a franchise. So I currently I started with them like in 2011 uh, at the Royal Oak location, but now I'm in a Wild Birds Unlimited in Grand Rapids and also Gross Point, Gross Point, Michigan. I've already enticed the Wild Birds Unlimited in Traverse City up north. So I will be going to Gaylord, Michigan, mid-October of this year. And I would like to meet the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited at Traverse City, show my work firsthand. I'm just trying to get my name out as an artist. And that's what we call direct marketing. You might as well show your birds that people who are interested with birds. See, the galleries that I've been exhibiting at, they're not specialized galleries that just specialize in nature, you know. 
I think I got to go and concentrate on galleries that f feature mostly nature and wildlife as opposed to these hit miss galleries that are looking for something like looking for something that's political or trying to make a statement like a social justice or a statement. Um, I see a lot of abstract artists that they have to uh, explain to the viewer what they're looking at, which my artwork is, you don't need that. My work is self-explanatory. You see it as a bird. This is the name of the bird and that that's it. And I don't have to use fancy words and letters to describe my work. I can just describe it face value and not have to, uh, for say, pump it up or make it something bigger than it really is. Do I sense dissatisfaction with how the public receives your art? Do you feel misunderstood? No, I just feel that maybe they're not seeing it as art. They're seeing it as more illustration than art. They're seeing it more commercial. Like the majority of the galleries in the Detroit area are mostly contemporary. So they don't really want realists. I had a friend had told me that abstract artists hate realists because they can't draw. I mean, I'm sure I could probably make a fake painting of somebody else's abstract art. I mean, it would it would not be that hard. I just don't want to like be phony. I want to be real. I want to be. I'm thinking I'm probably in the wrong venues for my art. I gotta maybe go where there's more into the nature part. My plans are to get into uh, other stores up north. Uh, uh, what I think was happening, uh, the, the, the wild birds that I approached, the first one was in Traverse City, Michigan, and the second one is in Gross Point, Michigan. At, at this point, they can't display my birds because there's no room on the floor. They got too much merchandise. So what I, my theory is what I think what happened was when COVID hit in 2020, we had this shutdown. So whatever merchandise they had, they couldn't sell it. They couldn't sell it in 21. They probably still got it left over this year in 22. The worst time to contact a nature gallery or Wild Birds Unlimited is, is during the uh, tourist season. Because you think about it, after Labor, after Memorial Day, people start going up north. When, during the summer, when the tourists are there, they're they're on the floor selling their merchandise. That's the way I say it. I was selling way up in the north in Copper Harbor in the Upper Peninsula. It was a nature gallery called Studio Forty One, and she says the best time to contact a gallery or nature gallery or a store, especially up north, because it's not year long. It's only for the summer. She actually says the best time to get contact them. Is between the months of January and March, which is downtime because it's all snowy and icy up there. And uh, they probably have a lot of time on their hands to look to, um, look at emails and so forth. I was in seven art shows last year. Um, been in about four for this year. Like I said, COVID did take a toll with the gallery, uh, the gallery scene. I had my... Uh, as I mentioned, I was selected for my school, the College Creative Studies, for the scholarship program for that school. And I was I was named the featured artist for that show. Um, I had my own wall, my feature artist wall. Um, it was March of 21. COVID was still around. Um, we did not get much of a crowd. The, for the opening and reception, but the good news out of all that was that the president of the College of Creative Studies bought two of my owl prints on the first day of the opening, so that made me feel good. Are you teaching at this school? Uh, no, I am not. I, I was teaching uh, senior, senior citizens how to draw back in 2011 and 12. Um, you know, when you teach art, uh, 
I notice how the students, they become very discouraged when they make mistakes. But I don't, sometimes I don't think making a mistake is a mistake, but I think what it is is it's like a discovery that you do something that you weren't intending to do and then you did it and then you, it, it kind of opened up a door in terms of technique. You know, people have asked me in the past, I, I wish I could draw, can you teach me how to draw? It's like trying to teach someone how to speak Chinese. It's, 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 you have to be patient. But, you know, it, it does help working with people. And um, I had made some, uh, something like, like this thing, if you need to make a straight line, if you need to make a straight line, like here's the paper. And I came up with an idea. If you need to make a straight line, all you have to do is you fold this like this, like that, and then you draw uh, like this here. A line and, and you know you fall here to say like this and then there, there's your line see it's just the idea I had um I told him uh you know when it comes to drawing you need to uh come up but what I was taught in school so basically what I was taught in high school in my freshman year um when it comes to drawing, you come up with this here. These are the five basic shapes. You have the cylinder, the circle, the triangle, and the square. <laughs> Out of all these five shapes, you could draw, say, a still life. You could draw a vase with some apples in a basket. You use these shapes to incorporate your underlining preliminar preliminary sketch. So... Oh, this is another, another aspect too, is when I draw that unfinished look, you think I could pull something off my Instagram page and show you, or will that not work on the on the Zoom? Because I wanted to show you something on Instagram real quick. Okay. Um, I have a picture of a female cardinal that I drew, unfinished, but it looked... There's just something about it. it was just really intriguing. That's my unfinished drawing of the Northern Cardinal. And that was, and here, here's the final one I did with the flowers in the background, uh, that light there. So this is my experimental pastel background I did for my Eastern, the Eastern Bluebird, which is the, State Bird of New York. That's the Eastern Bluebird that I did. See the uh, these lines in the background? It's pastel. It's all pastel. It. I showed it. I got like fifty-seven likes on Facebook on it, and uh, they they you, they can tell it's a winter background. That's another thing I incorporate in my drawings too. Is the season? You have the summer, the spring, and the fall. That's why maybe making a calendar would might be an idea. I want this is my cardinal there, my cardinal with pine needles. Yeah. So I was doing like different stages of my work. I was posting it on on Instagram. This is why if I have a soul show. I saw that at the Detroit Institute of Arts when they had the show on um, the mural artist. Uh, that you heard of Dega Rivera, right? As well as the finished pieces, people like to see a, a study or a uh, preliminary sketch. They like to see how it goes from point A to point B within a process. How can people find your artwork? How can they purchase it? I have a website. It's groganbirds.com. Um, it is a, it's, it's a portfolio website for presentation. But you can submit a contact if you go to my website and pick the birds and the number of the birds that you want. You can email me at 
Jim Grogan, birdart at gmail.com. My next move, I'm going to try to see if I can get my artwork, my bird no cards at the Detroit Institute of Arts gift shop. Is there a bird you identify with this bird? It would probably be the blue jay. Yeah. This is a bird I saw often in my backyard. It was a bird I saw frequently. I will be very honest with you. Some people are afraid of birds. Yeah, my niece is. She's that movie called The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. She says, I hate birds. Birds scare me. How can you help people to appreciate birds and love them? Um, I think by adding, like my ideas I had about adding flowers. Maybe adding flowers would maybe calm people down. <laughs> of course, color has to test it. Has to has a, an important role in it, and color has important uh, as well into the um, drawings themselves. Um, I could I see think about it. I could have a show, a mixture of birds, insects, butterflies, and flowers. Not every piece in the show has to be a bird. I could have a mix and match, and that way, I can please other people that wouldn't if they're. Not in the birds, they might see something else that I did and that will help complement my other other uh, bird drawings if I do other things, especially when I incorporate color and beauty. So I had my, uh, met my girlfriend at a lunch in in Birmingham, Michigan. This was in 2011. And I brought my briefcase and I brought my bird cards and she saw her old kindergarten teacher there and she was looking at the cedar wax wings and she, she fell in love with them. And she was so moved by them, she started crying out of happiness and she didn't have the money to pay for it. So her former kindergarten teacher bought her as a card. So, and I asked her on a date the same day. So it all worked out. We broke up, but we're still friends. Yeah. How do you see the future, considering that the ecosystem is shrinking, birds are losing their habitat, um, artists might need to go further and further in the forest to find them. Right, right. I just wish they would just, instead of pushing this throwaway disp disposable society, I wish they would just make lean it towards where they actually are going to do something about this. Uh, my friend's husband works for Detroit Diesel, and they're trying to figure out how to put less emissions in the air because their ozone layer is starting to um, thin out. Um, I think as an artist, it's my duty to keep recording these birds and letting people know how important this is to, to keep intact, to save it all. I can't, it's so overwhelming to think about, like, our rural oceans are being used as landfills now. We got, do you ever wonder, what do they do with all this plastic, all this, all this packaging? Where does it go? Do they put in a landfill? Do they burn it? Is it in our system? Do we have microplastics in our bodies? Um, just think about it. If you went just maybe 100 years ago, if you went 300 years ago, everything was beautiful. Everything was brand new. And then the Industrial Revolution, it kept building and building and building. Actually, companies knew about climate change way back in 1956. And then they did their own studies. But now it's gotten to the point, even if we stop everything right now, if we stop everything that's destroying our planet, it's already been too, it's already too late. What's really sad is that the corporations are going to use climate change and environmental to sell more products. You're going to say, this is 
organic, or this is biogradable, or this is this, or this is that, just to make money on the environment to say that their product is environmentally sound. I just, you can just have a mental breakdown thinking about all this stuff, you know. I want to just do my art, put it out there, and let people see the beauty. And just try, try, try that. Does that, does that really, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. Okay, this was a question that was asked by Swords into Plowshares, the uh, Okay, so the first question is, describe the work you create. Over the course of my art journey, I have developed a style of combining tightness and looseness to make my birds lifelike and energetic with detail and vivid color. I convey a sense of brightness and bring joy and happiness to the world. Question two, why is this artwork important to you? My artwork is important to me because I want to educate both young and old on the importance of conserving bird species and their natural habitat and record the science of ornithology for future generations. Last question, how does your artwork reflect or support the cause of social justice? My bird renderings are an impression that tells others that everyone is entitled to the beauty of nature. It is intended to be shared with others within our own ecological community. I care about birds and want to share this passion. 